Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at the definition of gross income and look at basic concepts when it comes to the IRC, the Internal Revenue Code definition. Well, here's the definition, pretty straightforward. The taxpayer gross income includes all income from whatever source derived unless specifically excluded. So here's what they're telling us. Congress and the IRS says, based on our Internal Revenue Code, Everything that you receive is income, unless we tell you it's not income. So you don't look in the code to determine whether this amount is taxable or not. You look to see if it's excluded. So the definition is all inclusive definition, all income. Show me it's excluded. If you can show me in the code it's excluded, it's excluded. Otherwise, it's included. And this concept of gross income applies to individual, um, corporations, partnership, or estate. It's very inclusive definition so i can give you for example of an income that's excluded just to make sure kind of you understand what excluded is for example interest on municipal bonds it's excluded if you buy a bond from a local or state municipality you earn interest from that bond the interest on that bond is excluded as far as the irs it's specifically stated that municipal bond are excluded now why they're excluded when we talk about interest i will discuss why but the point is if it's not explicitly ex excluded it's included now the definition is very broad but bear in mind not every amount you receive in cash to be included in your gross income for example if you borrowed money from the bank that's cash but that's not income why it's a li liability you have to pay it back as it comes due also Income may not be in cash. So sometimes you might have income considered income for tax purposes, but it's not cash. An example will be bartering, exchange of services. For example, I am a teacher. Well, guess what? I will give you two hours of tutoring. In return, you will give me something else. Well, that's an exchange of services. I did receive, for example, let's assume my hourly rate is $150. Well, I gave you two hours of tutoring, that's $300. Well, you don't have you, you don't have $300, you gave me your old iPhone. I said, okay, that's fine. Well, guess what? I did not receive any cash, but I do have income under those circumstances. Ex I'm sorry, exchange of services means, let's assume you, you painted my house instead, or you gave me your phone, which is the fair value of property received. So both of these situations, no cash exchange hand, nevertheless, I do have to include the value in my gross income. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. We need to be aware of something called recovery of capital doctrine or ROC, return, or return of capital, ROC. Well, the amount received is not taxable until the taxpayer recovered their original amount, their basis. How, how is that applied? For example, when you sell an item, if you're in the business of selling product, well, guess what? You sell an item for $10, you paid for it six, that's your cost, so you are taxed only on the additional $4. So first you have to recover your basis. So the profit is taxable, the $4 is taxable. This concept we'll see it later on when we deal with sale of capital asset where you have a basis and you, on, you only pay prof, you only pay taxes on the gain. Let's actually take a look at an example. In year one, Celine acquired 1,000 shares of XYZ company for $10 per share. Well, she paid $10,000. In year four, in order to make a down payment on a, on a new home, Celine sold the 1,000 shares at 22. Well, she sold them. When she sold them, she sold them for $22,000. That's good. So, amount realized 22. Cost basis is 12 or adjusted basis is 12. Celine will have a gain of 12,000. Okay? 
So she took this money, Celine paid the collected. Uh, on the same day, Celine paid the collected 22,000 to her bank. How does this transaction affect her gross income? Only 12,000 is included in gross income because that's the, um, the gain realized from the sale and that's the gain that's, that's taxable as well. It's worth noting that had Celine borrowed the money, she needed to make the down payment. She wouldn't have to report any gain on her gross income. So she could have borrowed this money. Then that, that's not taxable. Okay. She sold her asset and paid taxes on the difference. Recognition of income. What does that mean? It means when do we record, recognize income? You should be familiar with this concept from financial accounting. In general, the timing of income depend on the basis. We have cash basis, we have accrual basis, and we also have other hybrid basis. Under the cash basis, well, the receipt of cash triggers the recognition of income. It's cash basis. I receive the cash, I have income. Well, if I pay the cash, I have a deduction, I have an expense. Under the accrual basis of accounting, revenue is reported when earned and expenses are deducted when incurred. For income tax purposes, taxpayer will have to choose their accounting method. Usually for most individuals and small businesses, it's we use the cash method. Now we're not gonna stop about this topic, but for now we're gonna stop discussing this, which accounting method, but that's gonna have one future lesson later on. Also when talking about income, we have to differentiate what's economic income and what's accounting income. Because if you understand the difference between economic and accounting income, it's gonna help you understand how the IRS comes up with this income. You have a gross income, you have income. So let's start with economic income. How is economic income measured? Well, it's the difference between, uh, it's the difference between the fair value of your net asset, which is assets, not asserts, assets minus liabilities. At the beginning of the period as compared at the end of the period, plus value of consumption. So let's assume for the sake of simplicity, I purchased a home for $300,000 at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of year 1. At the end of the year, my home is worth $370,000. Well, I have an increase. Let's assume home has no mortgage, just simply put to keep it simple. So the value of my doesn't have to be a home. The value of my net asset started at 300 and up at 370. I have an increase in my wealth of 70,000. That's an increase increase in my wealth. That's economic income. And let's assume for the sake of illustration, I spent $30,000 in consumption. So my, my, my assets went up in 70. I consumed 30. Basically, I'm overall $100,000 better off. Well, we don't use this economic income. Just think about it from a practical perspective. You have to keep track of your assets, your liabilities, the difference between them and the value of your consumption. It's a big headache. So what do we do? We use accounting income. How do you use accounting income? Well, the income must be realized. So to have an income, there's, there must be an exchange between two parties. And we're assuming those two parties are external parties. They're not related party. And the amount it is objectively measured. Think about trying to measure the fair value of your assets at the beginning of the period versus the end of the period. Now, if you have stocks, that's easy. Assuming they are publicly traded because you know the price. Let's assume you have a car, a boat, a motorcycle, several homes, computers, printers. Those are your assets. How are you going to measure the fair value of those at the end of the period? And this is why it's a big headache. Therefore, we use the accounting income. Simply put the accounting income. If you realize the income, it doesn't matter how it's realized and it can be objectively measured. For example, if an employee embezzles money, that's income to the employee. Why? Because there's an exchange. The, the exchange of what? The employee took the money. The income is realized, took the money from the other party. Of course, that's an external party, right? And the amount is measured because we know how much the employee embezzled. Let's assume you grow a garden and consume the product. That's not taxable. Yes, you grow the garden. Now you are better off, but you consume the product. Let's assume you sold those fruits and vegetables from the garden. Then the amount is taxable. Notice once, if you consumed it with your family, let's assume you grew, for the sake of illustration, 700 worth of fruits and vegetables in your garden and you consumed the whole thing. So if you went to the market, you'd have to pay 700. You did not, you grow it. Well, that's fine. If you consumed it, not taxable. If you take that fruit and vegetables and you sell it, Let's assume you sell it for 700. You might, you know, deduct expenses. Whatever is left is taxable. Let's assume you had no expenses for the sake of illustration. 
the whole amount is taxable. So if you sold it to a third party, it's taxable. Also, we need to be aware of advanced payment because every time we receive cash, it doesn't have to be income for now, but the rules are a little bit different. Advanced payment is when you receive money for services to be performed later. So what we're talking about here is unearned revenue or deferred revenue. How does it work from tax perspective? Individual taxpayers receiving advanced payment for future delivery of goods or services, again, we're, we are talking about unearned or deferred revenue, are required to recognize the income in the year in which the cash is received. So a little bit different than GAAP. Now, why? The concept is this. If you receive the cash, it means you have the ability to pay. We have something called the ability, the ability to pay concept. The ability to pay concept means if you have the cash in your hand, the IRS wants their share. You have the money to pay. Therefore, it's taxable. However, there's small shifting. You can defer or shift your income a little bit. Taxpayer using accrual basis of accounting may elect to defer the recognition of income up to one year following the tax year. So if you're using accrual basis, you can defer the income, but a little bit more up to the following tax year. Okay, so they give you some leeway. Okay, Radhi is a guitar instructor. She uses the accrual basis of accounting. Okay, there's some room for deferring income. And is a calendar year taxpayer. It means December 31st. They elected to defer advanced payment received for future, for future services to the extent possible. So here's the deal. On August 15, 20X1, she collected 5250 for a contract consisting of 100 lessons. So the 5250 if we divide this by 100, each lesson will earn Radhi $52.50. The lessons are expected to start November, year X1. 14, less, 14 lessons will be held in year one. So let's say year one. And the remaining lessons will be eventually split between year two and year three. So what can we do? We receive the money here. Well, since we are using accrual, if we're not using accrual, if we're using cash basis, the whole amount will be taxable here. If we're using accrual, the first year, what you're gonna do, you're gonna spread that money over the 14 lessons, those are the 14 lessons, then the remaining, they cannot go over year two. Then the remaining will be, which is 100 minus 14, 100 minus 14, 86 lessons will be in year two. Now, although some of them in actuality you will not deliver them in year three, it doesn't matter. Yes, you can def defer them, but up to one year. So make sure you're aware of this. And we'll talk about that later we'll we'll have when we talk about accounting method so should so radhi should report 735 of income which is uh 14 lessons times 52 dollars and 50 cent and the remaining will be reported in year x2 although some of the service will not be provided to x3 you got the money we give you we gave you a little bit of time to defer up to one year we're being very generous thank you very much also we need to be aware of something called constructive receipt of income okay so sometimes what happens is you may not have the money physically but you have access to it this is what the constructive receipt of income is you have to recognize it means include income and your taxes in the period in which the right of the property is obtained if you have the right to the money you, you obtain that right as long as there's no sub substantial restriction it's taxable Okay, restriction means let's let's assume someone gave you a check, but the funds are not available in the bank account of the person that gave you the check. Well, that's a restriction. But let's um, let's assume the amount is readily available. Well, guess what? It's income. Let's assume your favorite company send you a dividend check. You you invest in a company and they send you a dividend check. The check is in the mailbox on December thirty first the check in the mailbox, and you decided not to walk to the mailbox, pick it up, and deposit it in the bank. Well, guess what? That's income. Let's assume you have a bank account and interest earned in that bank account. You never touch the money. The money stayed at the bank. It does not matter. As long as you can get it, it's called constructive income. Also, we need to be aware of a concept called assignment of income. Simply put, the concept is this. The fruit and the tree are connected together. So the fruit that the, the fruit that comes out of the tree belongs to that tree. Simply put, you cannot assign your income to another individual. So the person that earned is the person that paid the taxes. Why? Well, 
if you could assign your income what you will do is you will shift your wages to someone in the family that has a lower tax bracket for example you would shift your wages to your kid or to your father who, who you claim is helping you well you can give them the money but you cannot tell your employer to cut the check to them so you cannot have this shifting of income also we need to be aware of something called the tax benefit rule what does that mean it means if you pay an amount in year one and that amount was deducted in year one a good example will be medical expense so let's assume in year one and we'll talk about medical expenses later you paid eight hundred dollar in a particular medical expense now don't you know not gonna get technical here okay and you were able to deduct it in other words this was a deduction on your taxes well guess what in year two you paid this amount and you took the deduction in year two the insurance company reimbursed you the eight hundred dollar is the amount eight hundred dollar taxable well it is taxable if the benefit was realized in year one so if you deducted if this amount was deducted and and you realized a tax deduction you realized a saving because of this eight hundred dollar well let's make it eight thousand or eighty thousand it doesn't really matter let's make it eight let's make it eight thousand dollar well if you deducted eight thousand dollar from those medical expenses and in year two you receive the money well guess what it's taxable so if the amount was deducted to the extent that it benefited you it's taxable if the amount was not deducted in year one then it's not taxable in year two so if you did not take an advantage of that payment and they gave you the money they basically given you back your money that you paid the irs has nothing to do with it because you did not take advantage of that now about the tax benefit rule we're going to have a separate session because we need to talk about state and local taxes and sometimes you you may get an advantage uh you may get advantage means a tax deduction in one year then you get a refund in year two what do we have to do so but this is the general idea so all in all here's a list of sources of income that you need to be aware of income sources include but are not limited to why because unless it's excluded it's included what could be it compensation for services here we're talking about w2 business income gain on disposition of property royalty income rental income interest income dividend income alimony payment and we'll talk about those later received under a divorce agreement executed on or before december 31st 2018 annuities distributive shares of flow through entities c corp partnership bartering and the list is unlimited now in the next session i'm going to focus on one thing only and start with w2 that i'm going to talk about each one of these income separately in a separate session because that's important now we get we get the big idea now we need to talk about each income separately what should you do now go to farhat lectures whether you are a cpa candidate or an enrolled agent or an accounting student and look at true false multiple choice additional exercises additional lectures that's going to help you do better study hard your accounting certification is worth it Good luck, study hard, 